we will now give the floor to the final speaker of our session, uh, Maura Maldonado, who will present on learnability and constraints on the semantics of clause embedding predicates. All right, thanks. Okay. Uh, so let me share the screen. Okay, can you see the screen? Oh yes, I got the presenter wrong, sorry, it is not Mora. <laughs> yeah, it's all right. Okay, so um, this talk is about the relationship between learning and the semantics of predicates that embed causal complements. So in this talk, we'll specifically focus on the class of closed embedding predicates that can embed both declarative complements and interrogative complements. So these predicates are, for example, uh, know, imagine, or be certain, or report in English. And so these predicates can embed a declarative complement and an interrogative complement. So for example, no uh, can be fine in Joe knows that it's raining and Joe knows whether it's raining. The meanings of predicates that behave this way are quite diverse across languages. Uh, however, not all possible meanings are attested. So for example, Spectan and Gray speculate that we cannot find a predicate that has the semantics of this fictitious predicate, Shno. So which means uh, know when it takes a declarative complement and wonder when it takes an interrogative complement. So Josh knows that it's raining would mean Joe knows that it's raining and Josh knows whether it's raining would mean Joe wonders whether it's raining. And the claim is that we cannot find such a predicate uh, in a natural language. The question then is what differentiates attested predicates like no from unattested predicates like no. So in other words, what is the constraint on the possible meanings of closed embedding predicates? Uh, one possible constraint uh, uh, proposed in the literature is called closal distributivity or C distributivity for short. So the constraint states that uh, for any attested predicate B, Joe V's Q, where Q is an interrogative complement, can be paraphrased in terms of in declarative terms as Joe's relationship to a specific answer. Q. So for example, if we have Joe V's weather is raining, we should be able to paraphrase it as Joe V's that it's raining or that it's not raining. Or more formally, C distributivity can be stated like, like this. So if we have X V's Q, where Q is an interactive complement, that is equivalent to there is an answer P to Q such that X V's Q, uh, sorry, X V's that P. So let's see how this constraint applies to concrete predicates. So what about no? So Joe knows whether it's raining can be paraphrased as Joe knows that it's raining or that it's not raining. So there's this equivalence and that shows that a no satisfies the distributivity. What about report? Joe reported whether it's raining is equivalent to Joe reported that it's raining or that it's not raining. So again, um, report satisfies C distributivity. Now, what about this fictitious predicate, Schno? Joe Schno's whether it's raining means Joe wonders whether it's raining. Does it mean the same thing as Joe Schno's that it's raining or that it's not raining? Well, no, because Joe Schno's that it's raining or that it's not raining means Joe knows that it's raining or that it's, it's, uh, it's not raining. Because uh, Schno means no when it takes a declarative complement, wonder when it takes an interrogative complement. So in the case of Schnoe, there is no equivalence, and that shows that Schnoe violates C distributivity. So if you're just looking at these three predicates, uh, no report and Schnoe, uh, it seems that this uh, constraint uh, makes correct predictions. So it rules in attested predicates, it rules out uh, this unattested predicate Schnoe. But more broadly, what kind of evidence do we have to support uh, this constraint? So Floris Lusen and myself did a small-scale cross-linguistic survey to investigate the empirical validity of C-distributivity. And one of the important uh, takeaways of this uh, survey is that many, if not most, attested closed embedding predicates indeed satisfy uh, C-distributivity, but with some notable exceptions, including uh, so-called predicates of relevance in English, uh, uh, such as care to care to matter and so on, and other interesting predicates, um, Estonian Moflema, uh, Tagalog Magtaka, and so on. In another recent study, uh, Shane Stein and Strelkeld uh, compared how fast 
uh, neural network models learned different close embedding predicates, differing on whether or not they obey C distributivity. And in this study, he found that predicates that satisfy the constraint were learned faster than predicates that don't. So it looks like we are getting converging evidence for the existence of this constraint. However, importantly, we currently don't have any behavior evidence for the constraint. So in this talk, we'd like to bring in new evidence for the constraint from human learners. So uh, we tried to investigate uh, this constraint by looking at learning in an artificial language setup. Uh, the underlying idea is that these constraints are meant to be cognitive in nature, so learners are expected to be sensitive to uh, them. And they can be sensitive in two ways. So learners might find words that satisfy these constraints easier to learn, and they can also tend to generalize these constraints to new occurrences. And what is very important is that learning could also shed light on the source of these constraints as, uh, that we see in the typological data, because one could think that the reason why these constraints exist typologically is precisely because words that satisfy them are easier to learn. Um, there are several recent experimental studies that have used artificial language learning techniques to tap into similar questions, uh, including questions about quantified monotonicity, personal pronouns, and so on. Uh, the goal of this talk is to extend this approach to uh, closed embedding predicates. Okay, so in our experiment, uh, we tested whether participants infer a C distributivity when learning a novel closed embedding predicate. So uh, the predicate is written as lem in our experiment, pronounced as lem. Uh, in the training phase, uh, the participants get training on the meaning of lem when it takes a declarative complement by observing various situations where sentence of the, sentences of the form x lems that p is true. In the testing phase, um, they are asked to interpret sentences where lem takes an interrogative complement. So for example, x lems whether p. The hypothesis we'd like to test is that the participants infer that lem satisfies C distributivity in this testing phase. Now, uh, what does LEM actually mean when it takes a declarative complement? Uh, we had two groups of participants, one group who learned that LEM means what we call false bell, the other group uh, who learned that it means what we call no false. Uh, let me talk a bit more about these two meanings. So let's start with, uh, with false bell. False bell basically means falsely believe. So our participants are told this meaning with respect to declarative complements. So for example, uh, they learned that Joe learns that it is raining outside is true in this picture. So in this picture, Joe is pointing at the rain gear. So she believes that it's raining outside, but it's in fact sunny outside. So she has a correct, uh, she has a false belief that it's raining outside. And so in this uh, picture, this sentence is true under the false bell reading. So Joe falsely believes that it's raining outside. And then they are required, the participants are required to generalize the meaning to sentences with interrogative complements. So more specifically, they are asked to give a truth value to a sentence like Joe Lem's weather is raining outside in these three types of scenarios. The no answer scenario where Joe doesn't have any idea, a true answer scenario where Joe has a correct belief, and a false answer scenario where Joe has an incorrect belief. The question is, whether participants assign an interactive embedding meaning in line with C distributivity. So what's the prediction? Well, if false bell obeys C distributivity, then Joe false bell whether P is true if and only if Joe falsely believes that P or Joe falsely believes that not P. Now this means that the sentence is true just in, uh, just in case Joe has a false belief. So the sentence Joe learns whether it's raining outside would be true in this scenario but false in these two scenarios. Okay, let's move on to the other predicate, uh, no false, predicate meaning no false. Um, X no false that P uh, basically means that P is false and X knows that P is false. So our participants learned this meaning by observing that, for example, Joe learns that it's raining outside is true in this picture. So in this picture, Joe is pointing at the, the sunny year and it's sunny outside. And so she uh, knows that it's not true that it's raining outside. It's false that it's raining outside. So under the no false reading, so this sentence is true. And as before, 
uh, they are asked to generalize the meaning to interrogative and meaning sentences. That is, they are tasked to give a truth value to a sentence like Joe Lem's whether it's raining outside, given these three types of scenario. If they assign a meaning that is in line with C distributivity, Joe no false whether it's raining is true if and only if Joe no false that it's raining or that it is not raining, which is true just in case Joe has a correct belief that it is not raining or she has a correct belief that it is raining. So the sentence will be true just in the true answer scenario. So it will be true in the true answer scenario and false in the no answer and false answer scenarios. And here uh, it's important to note that the constraint predicts different response patterns for the two predicate meanings. Okay, so in our experiment, we have recruited 85 uh, participants in the false bill condition, uh, 111 participants in the no false con condition, and we have also set exclusion criteria. So this is because we wanted to make sure that the participants did not think that LEM with declarative complements meant something that it did. So, um, so a participant had to learn the declarative embedding meaning of predicates to move forward to the testing phase. But what does it mean for a participant to successfully learn uh, the declarative embedding meaning? So in the training phase, we expose participants scenarios where the sentence is a good description and those where the sentence is not a good description. And um, they had to make truth value judgments on these scenarios to which we provided feedbacks. And only participants who achieved a mean accuracy of at least 66% on each type of scenario in, this, uh, in the training uh, uh, were included in the analysis. Okay, so after this exclusion, uh, we had 40 participants for false spell and 30 participants for no false. Now I'll talk about the general difficulty of the experiment a bit later. Um, so these graphs show that uh, these participants who passed the exclusion were very good in learning the meanings of the predicate with respect to declarative complements. So they correctly judged that false belt is true only in the false uh, falsely believed scenario, and no false. Uh, uh, they judged that no false is true only in the no uh, no false scenario. Now let's review the predictions in the testing phase. What do we predict in the testing phase? if our hypothesis, that is, learners generalize meanings based on C-distributivity, is correct. So if learners infer C-distributivity, then Joe false bell whether P would be true just in case Joe believes a false answer to the question. On the other hand, Joe no false whether P is true just in case Joe believes a true answer to the question. So the prediction can be summarized as in this table. Okay, so finally, here's the plot of the results in the testing phase. Uh, each dot represents a participant. Remember that we predicted that in the false bell condition, they answer yes um, only to the false, uh, false answer scenario. And in the no false condition, they answer yes only, we predicted that they answer yes only, uh, only to the uh, true answer scenario. And here's a different plot that shows the percentage of response patterns uh, compatible with C distributivity aggregating of the scenarios. So we can see that in both conditions, the responses uh, tend to be compatible with C-distributivity. And indeed, statistics uh, confirms this, the proportion responses compatible with C-distributivity is significantly above chance. Okay, so um, what can we conclude from this? So uh, the results su suggest that learners infer the meaning of an artificial predicate in a way that satisfies C-distributivity. Uh, and the uh, uh, inferences they make are not dependent on some, some general strategy because we saw opposite response patterns for false spell and no false. And furthermore, we can say that the bias exists at least for these two distinct artificial predicates, false spell and no false. And their inferences are not easily accounted for by, uh, by the bi bias existing in their native language because English doesn't have predicates with these meanings and in fact, not all predicates in English are actually C distributive, as we saw. Now, let me talk uh, briefly about the general difficulty uh, that we saw in the experiment and the difference between uh, no false and false spell. So, uh, turned out that novel predicates that we tested were very hard to learn. So, we, we had to have a 50% inclusion rate for the no false condition, uh, sorry, uh, false spell condition and 70% exclusion rate for the uh, no-false condition. 
And this is not in principle problematic for our conclusion, as we were interested in how participants extrapolate or generalize to novel interrogative embedding meaning once they have learned that declarative embedding meaning. So we were only interested in those participants who were successfully learning the declarative embedding meaning. Um, but uh, the briefing data that, that we, we have uh, um, uh, have some insight into why this, this was happening. Uh, so the, the, the debriefing data suggests that excluded participants do not learn the antifactive component of the meaning. So the component of the meaning that suggests that the complement is false. So many participants who failed uh, the exclusion in the false bell condition suggested that the, uh, the predicate means believe. And the many participants in the no false condition suggested that the uh, predicate means no. So uh, here's a possibility to, to kind of understand what's going on with the general difficulty with the experiment, as well as the difference between the false spell and the no false. So one possibility is that antifactivity is generally hard. Um, so um, it's very hard to uh, learn a predicate that has this antifactive component. And furthermore, uh, it is possible that stronger difficult, there is stronger difficulty for no false, no false uh, than for false spell. Uh, due to the availability of similar meanings in English. So um, it's been suggested in the literature that belief actually triggers the inference, the uh, pragmatic inference that the complement is false in competition with no. So given the strength and meaning, belief means something like false spell. But there is no predicate in English that licenses an inference similar to no false. So that might contribute it to the, the extra difficulty with no false. Okay, so uh, let's uh, conclude. So uh, there is a grow growing body of research investigating the link between learning and semantic reversals. And we have extended this to a novel domain, namely a semantic constraint on closed embedding predicates. And we have provided first behavior evidence supporting the existence of the C-distributivity constraint at play during learning. And and C, distributi uh, C distributivity might drive inferences during natural language acquisition, and this might provide a potential mechanism explaining the universal that we see in the typological data. Okay, that's it. Okay, here's the pictures of my uh, collaborators, and I'll be happy to answer your questions. Uh, thanks to the speaker. I think we have time for one, max two questions. So if anybody in the audience. Hi. So, uh, hi. So I was wondering if you could go back to um, uh, this, this thing you said at the very beginning um, about um, these, di the distinctions being a sort of a based on a cognitive, something deeply cognitive. Um, and I was wondering how that um, how, how the data here, and especially the difficulty that people learn, um, sort of matches up to um, the cognitive uh, factors that you were, the, uh, yes, um, these sort of cognitive constraints that you would think that are quite easy to learn. And mm -hmm. other cognitive constraints tend to be, you know, very, very, you know, salient and things like that. So I was wondering if you could speak to that a little bit. Yeah, so, um, so I think, so there are two claims that in, in principle independent to to two claims. So one claim is that there is something deep, deeply cognitive about uh, the C distributivity constraint. And so learners tend to, so it, it, it's easier for learners to uh, learn a predicate that satisfies this constraint. And the other uh, claim is that there, the structure of learning uh, specifically for these types of predicates um, 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 bias learners toward uh, C distributivity. And our experiment actually are not, uh, our experiment actually is not uh, able to tease apart these two possibilities. So it's in, in principle compatible with our experiment. So the, the results that it is actually because of the structure of the learning that um, they, they infer C distributivity because C distributivity is stated precisely in a way so that um, um, the meanings of these predicates are stated in terms of declarative complements and the declarative, comp de 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 declarative cases are the input data that we provide. So, um, 
So yeah, so uh, to answer your question, I think uh, it is it is you know possible, um, it is compatible with with the results that it is kind of C distributivity is rooted in um, the facts, the nature of the learning, uh, the nature of the structure of the input data, and uh, in order to kind of tease apart the two two cases that two kind of claims that that I suggested earlier, we we might need some other experiments to um, um, to um, to, for example, see uh, whether predicates that uh, to uh, yeah, we, we, we might need some other kind of experiment, experimental designs where learners actually learn both interrelative and declarative complements um, in the in the input. And, and see whether predicates that satisfy C distributivity and predicates that satisfy non uh, 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 predicates that don't satisfy C distributivity differ in the ease of learning, for example. Great, thank you. And since we're just over time, I'm going to recommend if anyone has any future questions to just bring them to the speakers offline. So thank you all for attending this session, and let's thank all of our speakers again.